Good evening to everyone around the globe who joins us for this Geneva Trade Week panel session entitled The EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, Silver Bullet or Pandora Box. My name is Gabrielle Marceau. I'm a senior counselor at the WTO and law professor at the University of Geneva. And I'm very happy that we were able to assemble a number of excellent experts today to tackle this complex subject together with you, the audience. This session has kindly been organized by two of the experts who are with you today, Dr. David Klemman from Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, US, and Dr. Jody Kane from Overseas Development Institute in London. But before I introduce our experts today, let me say a few words about the task ahead. In the EU Green Deal communication of 19 December 2019, the EU Commission committed the Union to the objective of achieving climate neutrality by 2050. As part of the Green Deal initiative in March of this year, the Commission set in train the legislative process for the adoption of a carbon border adjustment mechanism by launching an inception impact assessment. The purpose of this mechanism is clear. The EU climate mitigation efforts could be undermined by a lack of ambition of third countries. And this would mean a risk of direct carbon leakage and declining EU competitiveness in energy intensive industries at the same time. Direct carbon leakage occurs inter alia when companies transfer production to countries that are less strict about emissions. In this case, global emissions would not be reduced. The mechanism would counteract this risk by putting a carbon price on the imports of certain goods from outside the EU and potentially rebate the carbon price already paid for EU production when exported. The exact design of this mechanism, however, is far from set in stone, and the European Commission is expected to deliver a proposal by mid next year. Our panel today will address the question of which policy design would be most suitable from a legal economic and political perspective, drawing from four briefing papers, which the European Parliament commissioned to a group of eight research scholars at and around the Brussels-based think tank Bruegel. Four of those experts are with us today. In a second step, our panel will turn its focus on the implications for this EU border adjustment the implication that may have for third countries and developing countries in particular. Some of the main concerns regarding the imposition of CBAs in general relate to the equity and principle of common board differentiated responsibility within the UNFCCC framework. For instance, the EU border adjustment may be applied regardless of countries' classification. But increasing the cost of trade for some developing countries could affect development trajectories as well as have adverse effect on least developed countries and small island developing states, even if they are exempted formally from such measures. Two of our panelists today will attempt to show what can be done to avoid such unintended consequences. Let me now briefly introduce our panelists with us today. First, Professor André Sapir from the Think Tank Bruegel in Brussels, who will speak to us about the origins of the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Initiative and potential responses from large third countries' economy. Second, Professor Gabriel Felbemeyer is the president of the Kiel Institute for International Economics and will explain to us the economic rational 
of CBAs, the board adjustment, and present what he views as the ideal carbon border adjustment mechanism. Third, Professor Lionel Fontanier is based at the economics think tank CEP2 in Paris and will outline the different policy options for us that the EU has at its disposal. Fourth, Dr. David Clayman, one of the organizers, is a visiting research fellow at the Institute for International Economic Law at the Georgetown Law Center in Washington. He will shed light on the legal feasibility under EU and WTO law. Dr. Jody Kane from the Overseas Development Institute in London will speak about the potential of unintended consequences for developing countries' perspectives that they mean to avoid. Stephen Février is head of the delegation of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States of the United Nations and will provide the perspective of small developing countries and their likely course of action. And last, but of course not least, you, you the audience, who we very much want to take part with your questions in the final third part of this session. About those questions, there are two ways for you to present questions to us. You can raise your virtual hand with the hand button in the Webex window, and the fabulous support team in Geneva, in the background, will manage the waiting line that develops. To start with, we'll have three of your present questions right, and then another turn of questions after the panelists offer brief responses. You can also send your questions directly to me after the first part with the panelist statement. And I will read three questions loud, and then panelists will respond. Please make sure that your questions are sent to all panelists and not to specific panelists. We very much look forward to speaking to you in this last third session. Time is running, so let's jump right into the discussions and see what our panelists have to offer today. André. The EU <clears throat> border mechanism initiative obviously didn't come out of nowhere, but has a history to it. What can you tell us about the previous experiences that led to the idea of introducing a European carbon border adjustment mechanism? And secondly, what were the major concerns and criticism that were directed at the notion of such an EU border adjustment in the past. André. Hello, Gabriel. Hello, uh, everybody. Glad to be uh, taking part in this, uh, in this great panel. So you're right that this, uh, this idea is not, uh, is not a new idea. Uh, I mean, if you go back to, uh, to the academic uh, literature, it was there already in the 1990s. Uh, you started to hear some European politicians uh, talk about it in the uh, early uh, early 2000s, and then uh, around uh, 2008, uh, the EU decided to implement a carbon uh, uh, carbon border measure in one sector in the aviation. That was the time when the EU decided that uh, ETS. The, the emission trading schemes, the domestic uh, EU measures to mitigate uh, carbon emission needed to be extended to the aviation sector and at the same time to introduce external measures, border measures, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, CB, the CBA. Now, that met with strong uh, opposition. Uh, by a number of uh, important uh, partners uh, with lots of flights to, uh, to and from the, uh, the EU. And uh, given the stronger position, uh, the EU essentially uh, abandoned uh, 
one can say, suspended the application of the CBA-like measures. So the EU kept the ETS in place, sort of the domestic measures for inside the, the, the EU. Uh, there is uh, uh, an emission trading scheme for, for the aviation, but they suspended the measure for uh, the international flights uh, outside of the uh, outside of the of the EU. Now, why was there such an uh, opposition? Uh, in fact, the opposition was not so much on immediate economic grounds, because in fact the tax, both in the sense the internal EU tax and the external tax, was at a rather low level. So the economic impact uh, of the measure would not have been uh, that uh, that important. It was mostly a political uh, opposition. And the, the, the political reaction was based on the view uh, that it implied violation of sovereignty. Because uh, the measure would have applied not only in uh, over the European airspace, but also uh, on the airspace outside of the EU. So let's say a flight between uh, Brussels and, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, Tokyo, uh, you know, the, 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 the measure would have hit not only over the European space, but also over the entire flight between, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Frankfurt and, uh, and, and Tokyo. So the opposition was really a political opposition. It was so strong to say that, that the EU dropped the measure, although one can argue that the EU got something out of this measure, which was and still is a discussion at the international level uh, to try to come to an agreement, uh, an international agreement, to reduce uh, carbon emissions by, uh, by airlines. So if you look, if you want to know what is the bottom line, the bottom line is that this was the only case of an international uh, CBA, the only time that domestic measures were supplemented by international measures, border-like uh, measures, that did not go down well. It means that today there is no such uh, example anywhere in the world. So the EU new measures would be first. Thank you, André. That's very interesting, particularly in light of the fact that to date, many argue that there has not been a significant leakage effect of existing CO2 pricing policies yet, at least. Now, turning to you, Gabrielle, my question is, is the lack of leakage surprising to you, and what do the models predict regarding future carbon leakage? Gabriel? Uh, and, uh, thank you, Gabriel, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, indeed, uh, there is uh, quite a bit of uh, exometric evidence uh, on the question whether carbon pricing regimes uh, do lead to direct carbon leakage or not. Remember, direct carbon leakage means that the domestic CO2 pricing leads to a replacement of uh, domestic production by foreign production to increasing imports of CO2 intensive goods so that the overall effect of such unilateral uh, carbon pricing remains ambiguous. It could even be that the global emissions go up if a clean domestic production is replaced by CO2 intensive foreign production. Now, uh, of course, we have the European emission trading system in place for many years already, and there are studies looking into the effects of carbon pricing on, let's say, the carbon intensity of imports, on the quantity of such imports into the European Union. And what these stu studies typically find is not much indeed. Now, is this surprising? I would say no, for two reasons. One reason is that the the price of uh, CO2 in the history of the ETS has been often very low. Only recently has the price uh, become a little bit uh, higher. Um, that's one argument why we haven't uh, uh, seen much in the 
economic literature. The second reason is that um, carbon pricing through the ETS is only one part, of course, of carbon policy. And I would argue that in most countries, uh, the regulatory burden that is imposed on companies uh, next to uh, the, prop the, the pricing of CO2 is also important and also drives uh, costs, uh, production costs of firms and may lead uh, to leakage. And when you only look at the CO2 price, you probably miss a lot of action. So looking at the CO2 price, you don't find much. If you take a broader perspective, you find some evidence for carbon leakage. What the literature also shows is that the amount of leakage goes up over proportionately with the price of CO2. So if we were to double the price of CO2, we would get more than a double increase in the amount of leakage that we can observe. So this is based on data on existing uh, regimes that we can observe. There's also studies that uh, do simulation exercises and asks through the lens of a model what would happen if in a model we impose CO2 pricing. And there, of course, you have a controlled environment in which you can do experiments. And what uh, those papers typically find is that um, uh, leakage uh, amounts to something like 15%, or in other words, 15% of the territorial savings in emissions that uh, are achieved through um, carbon pricing, for example, or cap and trade system are offset by higher foreign emissions. So 15% is not enormous again, but the simulation studies too give us uh, that lesson that as you increase uh, carbon pricing or if you make cap and trade regimes more narrow and more stringent, then that amount would go up very quickly. So there is a rationale for having uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanism. There seems to be a clear need to counter the leakage problems as carbon prices are rising. Lionel now, thank you for agreeing to join us today. Please enlighten us about what policy options the EU has at its disposal in its endeavor to implement an effective CBA mechanism. Lionel? Thank you, Gabrielle, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So before uh, looking at uh, the policy options, uh, it's certainly useful to clearly understand what exactly the question to be addressed by the policy is. And so I, I will really uh, adopt the reasoning of an economist. And I, I just said that if the problem is the increase uh, at the world level of you know, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a global issue because climate is a global good. And so what we need at the end of the day is a global solution. And the global solution that an economist would propose is typically one worldwide carbon price. This is not what happened yet. And so I don't think that we will uh, see it uh, very soon. And for different reasons. Uh, one is the incentive problem, because if Europe, for instance, reduces uh, its emissions, then it will reduce at the end of the day, the incentive for other countries to join. Because if Europe reduces its emission, it will reduce uh, the, the price of uh, you know, fossil energy at the world level. And so this is directly an economic incentive to uh, increase the consumption of these fossil fuels uh, elsewhere. And so this comes on the top of the direct leakage that was just discussed by, by Gabriel. So this is the indirect leakage. So this is the, the, the first problem. The second problem is the free riding, because uh, if Europe increases uh, the effort, uh, then uh, the, the rest of the, the world can decrease the, the effort. So there is a free riding problem. We will have free riders around. And uh, the, 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 the tougher the policy you adopt, uh, uh, the, the highest the, the possibility of uh, free riding, the probability of free riding. And now there is uh, another issue uh, that will be addressed, I guess, by, uh, by Jody and by Steve, uh, uh, which is the fact that low-income countries are actually penalized by former historical emissions of high-income uh, high countries. So for all these reasons, the EU adopted a local policy, a policy limited to the EU. Uh, so first, uh, we have uh, the system that has already been uh, described, 
by Gabriel, the Emission Trading Scheme, the ETS, which is basically a cap and trade system applied to carbon intensive industries. Plus, don't forget it, this has been said by Gabriel, at the country level, a taxation of carbon in transport, a taxation of carbon in housing, etc. And the EU took international commitments uh, during the, the, the Paris conference and uh, in, the, in the Paris agreement. So this is the local policy. It has to be complemented with another policy. And so let's look at the options. So just recap what the objectives are. There are three objectives. So the first is to reduce European emissions significantly. The second objective is to address these leakages, direct and indirect leakages. And the third, don't forget it, is to incentivize other countries to join the efforts. So what can be, what can be done? What can we do? Uh, first, you can adopt a series of measures at the border. Uh, so one uh, is the, the carbon pricing of imports, the CBA. This is just what we are discussing now. So importers will pay a carbon tax or they will purchase ETS allowances. It can be completed with a rebate for exporters. And then if you combine the CBA plus the rebate for exporters, this is what we're going to call the complete CBA for clarity. So you just rebate the tax as you would do for the, the value added tax. You can also impose a tariff at the border to compensate for the differences in carbon prices between the exporting country and the EU. And the problem is, and I think that we're going to discuss this this afternoon, that typically this is a discriminatory policy because you won't apply the same tariff to, to everyone. And last but not least, and uh, we will discuss this later, we can impose a uniform tariff to penalize non-participating countries. So this is what you can do at the border. And you can also complement your domestic policy in order to address this international problem. And you could complement your domestic policy with a consumption tax on all products, meaning domestic products and imported products based on the carbon content of these products and rebate it to exporters exactly again like a VAT. So these are the, the options. And you see that each option has big advantages, but also big drawbacks. And so this is not simple to, to decide what to do. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you for the different um, options. Now, David, you have written about the feasibility of these different options under both EU law and WTO law. For starters, how could these policies be enacted under EU law? And why is this important knowledge for our international audience? David? Well, thanks a lot, Gabriel. Um, as you already mentioned, the International Trade Committee of the European Parliament has asked Professor Paulin and I to provide this legal assessment of these three different policy options concerning the feasibility of, of this mechanism under EU law and WTO law. These Three policy options are um, a carbon tax that is adjusted at the border, uh, the inclusion of imports in the EU emission trading scheme, and third, as mentioned by Lionel just now already, the imposition of punitive tariffs on imports from countries that are not parties to the, trip to the Paris Agreement. Now, um, for EU law, what makes a great difference in terms of uh, domestic enactment is whether the envisaged measure is, a, is of predominantly a fiscal uh, nature or is a fiscal measure a tax or not. So the EU could, of course, adopt a carbon tax that is also applicable to imports under the legal basis governing environmental policy. That's not uh, an issue per se. But EU measures that are predominantly of fiscal nature are subject to a spe special legislative procedure that requires unanimity in the Council and excludes the European Parliament as a co-legislator, meaning that essentially one member state could derail the entire legislative dossier and you have an issue of uh, democratic representation, really. 
Um, there is one derogation to this rule uh, where the council uh, could ex ante switch to the ordinary legislative procedure, the normal way of, of, uh, of, of legislating in the EU, which requires only a qualified majority in the, in the council and includes the European Parliament as a co-legislator. But the council can only do this once again by unanimity, so that remains complex. And the problem remains that one member state could block the entire effort. And that is really why the Commission and the European Parliament have every incentive to propose a measure that does not involve taxation. What is much more realistic in any case is that the Commission would propose a measure that builds on existing on the existing emission trading scheme instead of turning to carbon taxation. And one option that is currently being discussed in Brussels, as far as I'm informed, is to require importers to purchase emission allowances at a product unit price that reflects the union average per unit emission cost. In other words, this measure would mirror the ETS, the, the emission trading scheme at the border, and impose an EU average cost, carbon cost per unit on imports. This measure could be adopted uh, quite normal with the ordinary uh, legislative procedure with qualified uh, council majority in co-decision with the European Parliament and under the treaty legal base, legal basis for environmental policy and or the legal basis for external trade policy. So blocking this effort would really require opposition from several member states. Um, what finally uh, could also be done is that you could, of course, also seek to impose a punitive tariff, as mentioned by Lionel, um, on countries that are not signatories to the Paris Agreement or do not implement their respective obligations. Uh, to that end, the EU would have to extensively amend the existing trade enforcement regulation um, and from a WTO legal, a legal perspective, um, this such a measure would be highly problematic in light of the past rulings of the WTO appellate body. Um, but uh, let me get to that a little bit later when we talk about um, WTO compatibility of, of, these, uh, of these different options. Gabriel? Trees that will potentially possibly be negatively affected by the new EU measures. Jody, the ODI is specialized in analyzing policy effects in vulnerable developing countries. What could be the unintended consequences of the EU border adjustment scheme and why is the international development community concerned? What should the EU do to ensure that the imposition of such border mechanism does not undermine its trade and international development objectives? Jody? Thank you very much, um, Gabrielle, and thank you to all of the panelists and Geneva Trade, Trade Week support for helping us to get this event off the ground. Uh, the previous speakers have outlined many of the economic and legal issues of port carbon border adjustments applied to imports. So I just will provide some of the, the trade and development um, perspectives on this. You know, which exporters are we talking about and what could be the unintended uh, consequence consequences. All of what we have learned over recent years about the kind of evolution of global value chains um, tells us that, you know, trade is extremely complex and input-output uh, matrices are comprised of a number of different countries and, most importantly, different types of firms. And these will all be more or less advanced in relation to their carbon policies as well as their applied uh, technology. So we know the sectors that are most likely to be targeted by border, border carbon uh, measures, but it's this ripple effects on the supply chains, which is really important to consider. And this is because the cost of adjustment may be passed lower down the supply chain. Though we can't say for sure, you know, how value chains will adapt, their associated governance structures are suggestive of certain trends. And this is particularly the case when we look at uh, commodities and the commodity inputs that that are supplied into some of the sectors that are most likely to be uh, targeted by the border uh, carbon uh, measures. So if we look at the sector um, aluminium, for example, 
we know that there are least developed countries that do supply some of the raw inputs into this sector. And even if they are exempt um, from the measure uh, per se, they may still be affected through the ripple effects of supply chains because of the nature uh, of the value chain governance. And some of the analytical work that the Bruegel Institute uh, has undertaken has referred to this as kind of extracting rent. And it's this market structure which enables the rent extraction. And it's essentially because commodity exporters tend to have a, a very weak bargaining position. So these, these effects may be passed lower on down the, the supply chain. Um, you know, that, that is obviously a, co a big cause co for concern. But looking onto your more optimistic, the more optimistic part of your, your question, Gabrielle, what can the EU do about this? There is a big opportunity, and I think we do have to remain quite optimistic because next year it's COP26 and all of the issues around carbon markets are still up for discussion. The EU is one of the world's largest traders. It's also one of the world's largest providers of aid for trade, and it could certainly do a lot more to ensure that its trade policy is better aligned with its climate policy and start to support countries in developing their monitoring, reporting and verifying frameworks so that they can prove either that they are taking commensurate action or that they are already low carbon because of their uh, production processes. So it's important that we start aligning uh, these two aspects of trade and climate policy and we work to ensure that countries that are already low carbon or that have challenges improving their compliance can do so and let's not let financial and technical barriers get in the way. Thank you. Thank you, Jody, for these important insights. Now turning to Stephen. Your organization represents the small island economies of the Eastern Caribbean. You are best placed to tell us why mm. small developing countries and least developed countries in particular are concerned about the imposition of border adjustment, not just from the EU, but in general. Mm. Stephen. Th thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, and to uh, the speakers who have gone before me. Um, of course, uh, these are my own reflections uh, and do not necessarily uh, reflect the views of my member states. Um, I think at the outset, it's important to note uh, that this is an important uh, step towards uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, and a move towards uh, decarbonizing uh, the global economy. And for me, I think that is an extremely laudable uh, objective. Uh, having said that, there are a few uh, overarching concerns. Uh, let me uh, start by addressing a few of the systemic concerns. Um, I think for small, from a small state's uh, perspective, uh, this mechanism uh, could be interpreted um, in some sense as being a bit uh, coercive. Um, and could lead, lead some SIDS to have to increase uh, their amb ambition uh, in the area of their own uh, national determined contributions or uh, through the, which are sort of being supported by the uh, NIPs uh, beyond their capacity to do so. Um, so in a sense, it may lead them to uh, take uh, on more ambitious outcomes than they have committed to under the UNFCCC process. Uh, so that is a concern uh, which uh, we have. Um, a CBA could uh, create a de facto uh, increase in ambition um, for some industrial production, uh, which if uh, we want to remain engaged uh, in some uh, value chain. So that is a systemic concern. Also, the... Uh, CBAM uh, will have some extra territorial impacts and in a sense could be seen as a de facto uh, uh, setting de facto standards uh, which we will have to comply with. And of course, uh, this is not dissimilar to recent experiences that small states have had with uh, the harmful tax initiative. Um, also the GDPR, um, and more specifically uh, on carbon markets, uh, the discriminatory air passenger duty, which was alluded to earlier. 
So again, uh, is this de facto standard setting and would there be opportunity for consultation? Uh, critically, uh, this appears to be a departure from, in my view at least, from the UNFCCC process. Um, and it may lead to the imposition of a measure with global effect uh, and impact uh, without sufficient consultation with those who will be uh, most affected by the measure, uh, particularly small states uh, and least developed countries. Um, beyond industrial production, um, and uh, specifically to small states, uh, those of us without significant industrial production, um, the literature which I have gone through and the uh, impact assessment, it is unclear uh, what the ultimate scope of the measure would be. Um, would it also impact on the supply of cross-border services, ultimately? Uh, so again, my personal concern is, will there be policy creep? Um, and that policy creep, uh, which I speak to in the services sector, is also, uh, let's say, validated by the APD, the air passenger uh, duty, which was uh, implemented previously and was withdrawn. There's also a question on reciprocity. Uh, would small states uh, that are in a position to be, would small states be in a position to impose similar measures in sectors where they are perhaps uh, have a less uh, or more carbon efficient on uh, the EU or other countries which uh, implement uh, such border adjustment measures? I think ultimately it is an important move uh, to quickly uh, and effectively reduce carbon emissions, but there I think is a need to ensure a sufficient uh, level of consultation, uh, and that consultation should uh, better uh, take into account the concerns of small states and LDCs. Thank you, Gabriel. Very uh, serious concerns, I agree. After this first round of remarks, we now want to delve a little bit deeper into the subject matter, starting with a closer look at the different policy options. Lionel, Nobel Prize laureate William Norder's famous climate club and a consumption tax seems to be possible alternatives. Tell us more about these two options. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, we have to uh, maybe summarize what the rationale of the CBA is. So, the idea is just that uh, non participating countries, when there is an effort, uh, when there is a reduction in emissions, non participating countries, at the end of the day, subsidize their carbon intensive industries because they don't participate. And so the CBA, which is currently contemplated by the EU, will definitively change the payoffs of this game. So this is good news. Second, the CBA would reinforce the political acceptability in the EU. You know, uh, people in the EU don't like taxes and if imported goods are taxed as well, then uh, it's maybe more acceptable from a political point of view. And last, if uh, we can uh, observe and impose on the basis of the actual carbon content of the exported product, then this will fix the direct leakage. So this is the rationale of this uh, measure. Now there are limitations too. The first limitation is just operational. The thing is that the actual carbon content is not observable. You cannot observe it for the reasons that Jody already mentioned. So there are complex GVCs behind it. And there is also an important element, which is that there is no uh, interest, there is no incentive uh, to disclose what the, the content is. So the exporter won't disclose the content. And so, as David said, we will be obliged to use the EU average carbon content of products because the exporter won't disclose the exact content and the, the exact content might be much higher. There is also a legal problem, and I leave this uh, to, to David later on, but uh, there is a problem of feasibility under the WTO and the EU law. Uh, 
there is a strategic problem. Uh, the strategic problem is the probability of uh, retaliation by countries affected by this CBA. And there is also an economic problem. The economic problem is that the CBA does not address the indirect like, leakage that I mentioned before. And to me, the indirect leakage is nowadays the key problem as the US left the United States, left the Paris Agreement. So th this is the landscape. So what can we do? As you said, Gabriel, the first alternative is a consumption tax. So the advantage of the consumption tax is to avoid the risk of international retaliation. And so under certain conditions that I won't develop, we don't have time, uh, this is equivalent to the complete carbon border adjustment. So it's going to treat the same way domestic production and foreign production. It will act, if it is well designed, on all the steps of the value chain. And it will target domestic products as well as imported products, but not exported products, which is the advantage of this, this tax. So the domestic producers and the foreign producers will pay the carbon tax when they sell their products to domestic consumers. But on the other hand, no producer, be it domestic or foreign, will pay the tax when it serves foreign consumers. So there are big advantages in the consumption tax. And last but not least, the tax revenues could be redistributed to production sectors to support cleaner production technologies. The problem is the political economy. So introducing a new tax in the current political arena of the EU is certainly not something easy to do. So there is, as you said, Gabriel, a second possibility of has been you know, envisaged, contemplated, at least in the literature, which has been uh, proposed by Nordhaus. This is the climate club. So this is a club, somehow, of countries having the same views about the climate change and how to proceed. So the advantage of such climate club would be to address directly the free riding problem. How would it work? So a uniform tariff on imports from countries that do not impose carbon policies internally would be uh, introduced at the borders of not the EU, but more generally of this club of countries having the same view about climate change and how to uh, fight this climate change. So directly, this will target the free riders, the countries that free ride, and this will be an incentive to join the club. This is not a carbon tax in the sense that it is set whatever the good and whatever the carbon content of that good is. So this is just a punitive tax. It does not need to be very high, a couple of per percent, but this is just to punish somehow countries that are not engaged in, uh, the, in, in policies for, for the uh, Then you get a tariff revenue. And the tariff revenue can be used to support climate-friendly policies in low-income countries. And the problem is, indeed, because there are problems, that it will only marginally reduce the leakage rate, leakage rate sorry, and that is, it has an impact only on countries for which exports are large enough in proportion of their GDP. And indeed, this is not the case of the United States. And we are again back to the more, you know, uh, geopolitical uh, situation problem. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Lionel, for these sort of three options. Now, Gabriel, you have written and spoken about what you consider to be the ideal carbon border adjustment. What would this look like, in your view, and how much can such a mechanism reduce the leakage rate at maximum? Gabriel? Yeah, thank you. So uh, what carbon border adjustment uh, should do in theory is move carbon pricing away from territorial emissions. So the emissions that are produced by factories or trucks in Europe and burden consumption by a carbon price. So uh, independently of where goods are produced, they should bear 
the price according to their carbon content. Now, as Lionel has pointed out, the carbon content of goods is not known and it's difficult to find out. But if we talk about an ideal system, you know, as a theorist, I'm allowed to just assume that we know the carbon content of goods. And then if we were to uh, uh, put a carbon price on the carbon content of imports and rebate um, the carbon price that has been paid by exporters, then we would indeed reduce leakage, and in that sense, direct leakage, um, to zero no? in a theoretical setup that would fall to zero. In that sense, that would be an ideal approach. And uh, if we uh, look into our models, uh, then we can show that such an approach uh, would also keep the so-called terms of trade uh, constant. So that means there is no beggar than neighbor problem associated to that. It would not change the relative price of exports and imports of our trade partners or of the European Union itself. So it's a neutral, a neutral instrument. It would work like the value added tax, okay, which we have and have had for many years and decades, and that you know seems to be um, um, okay with WTO law. Now, the big issue is, of course, we do not know uh, the carbon content of goods, and, and that's where the, I think the entire uh, problem hinges on. There's a second problem, of course, which uh, Lionel also already talked about, that is, um, if, even if we can, under those ideal circumstances that are you know, probably very unrealistic, but even under those ideal circumstances, we will not avoid indirect leakage. The fact that when we reduce the, uh, the use of fossil fuels, in Europe, then this will change the price uh, on global energy markets. With Citrus uh, Paribus reduce the price for gas and coal and uh, um, and petrol, and incentivize other countries to consume more. And uh, uh, even an ideal border carbon adjustment doesn't change this at all. And uh, uh, because the literature shows that the indirect uh, leakage problems are bigger than the direct ones. Uh, we must be aware that even an ideal border carbon adjustment uh, only heals uh, a small amount of the problem. And the literature says that, you know, the total leakage uh, that occurs direct and indirect together would at best be reduced by 15% through an ideal carbon border adjustment. Now, if we want to implement that, we, we cannot do the ideal one because we have those measurement problems and it will even fall much shorter. So in that sense, we shouldn't expect too much uh, from a practical border adjustment mechanism. Um, and in particular, uh, we should not expect uh, too much uh, when it comes to reducing the global emissions abroad. We can expect some uh, protection if you want, some leveling of the playing field for European firms, but the effect, the positive effect on global emissions will probably be very moderate. David, let's go back to the legal side of things, uh, because the different EU institutions have made clear the WTO compatibility of the future uh, board adjustment mechanism is an absolute must. What can you say about the compatibility of the different options just discussed, and uh, in particular with respect to WTO rules? David. Well, th thanks, Gabriel. I think that's a that's a big question to answer for in, in three minutes, but I'll, I'll do my very best. Um, so I think what is true is that uh, many commentators today agree um, that at least certain types of adjustment could pass the WTO legal tests. It's also true, I think, that much of these details, or much, much depends on, uh, on the details and the exact design of, of this mechanism. Uh, if we put that in slightly more cautious language, I think it's correct to say that there's a relatively narrow legal space um, that in which the CBA would indeed be consistent with WTO rules. And with regard to a lot of the measures that are under discussion right now, the answer still hinges on the basic uh, original question whether production and produ processing methods, uh, and in this case carbon intensity of production, uh, may be factored into the analysis of WTO consistency under, uh, under MFN. Article 2 and, our, and National Treatment, uh, Article 3 of the GATT. Um, and to, to just quickly run through, uh, you know, these respective issues uh, for Article 
uh, to two of the gut. The question is whether a tax on the PPM, on the pr production and, and processing method, rather than on the product itself, is adjustable at the border. Um, but here, this question has simply not been addressed um, in a definitive ruling uh, by a panel or the appellate body yet. For uh, MFN and national treatment, Article 1 and Article 3 uh, of the GATT, the question is whether uh, carbon intensity of production uh, may be factored into the determination of likeness of imports um, and uh, domestic produce, say steel, and would thus be uh, and would thus per permit uh, distinct treatment. Now, if, if that was so, um, it would of course be permissible to calibrate a carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism to the actual carbon intensity of the imported uh, products and treat such imports less favorably or differently than the domestic product. But as many of us know, uh, WTO case law gives no indication whatsoever that production and processing methods may factor into this determination of likeness. Uh, to the contrary, what matters uh, is the existing competitive relationship and therefore the test under Article 3.2 suggests that treating otherwise like products differently on the basis of their actual carbon intensity would violate the EU's national treatment obligations. If, on the other hand, um, a CBA would charge a cost on imports that is the exact same rate as the domestic product, a carbon tax or a CBA measure would certainly be defensible. The same is true um, for the slightly more realistic case, say, the uh, for a regulation, um, and notably uh, the emission trading uh, scheme of the EU that requires the purchase of allowances for imports. Now, if the allowances purchased per imported product unit does not exceed the cost per unit charged for the domestic like product, this regulation would be defensible under Article 3.4 of the GATT. And similar considerations, of course, also apply to the question as to whether a CBA would be consistent with MFN under the GATT if, for instance, uh, in the case of steel, um, from different origins, uh, they were treated differently based on the amount of carbon used in production or um, the carbon pricing regime of its origin country, the CBA would stand in conflict uh, with the EU's MFN obligations. On the other hand, um, if a product based on tax or uh, on if, the, if a product based uh, tax or charge uh, does not differentiate among carbon intensity of production, in the origin country, um, this measure would likely uh, withstand uh, article uh, a, a challenge under Article 1. Um, so the important takeaway from this is really that um, the more the EU uh, CBA calibrates towards actual carbon intensity of production uh, of the production process in the origin country, the more likely it will be inconsistent with Article 1, 2 or 3 uh, of the GATT. Um, now, that is from a perspective of carbon emission mitigation uh, not satisfactory uh, because it does, just simply doesn't allow uh, the EU to account for the actual carbon footprint of production abroad. Um, but if lawmakers decide that they do want to calibrate uh, the CBA to differences in carbon intensity of production uh, or carbon costs already paid uh, in third countries, um, that measure could still be sheltered uh, by exceptions in GUT Article 20B and GUT Article uh, 20G uh, with regard to measures relating to protect, protection of human health or uh, the compass conservation of uh, exhaustible resources. What matters here in the first place is, of course, whether the EU can establish that the measure credibly aims an, at an environmental objective. These are environmental uh, exceptions. Um, and, and whether it is least uh, trade restrictive compared to other measures. I think um, the first condition would really require the EU that the EU enacts and defends that measure purely based on environmental objectives and not competitiveness or trade concerns. Um, the second condition might be relatively easy uh, to meet, uh, given that a CBA compared to a complete import ban would be a relatively open policy. But in addition, Article, the Act, Article 20 GUT exceptions uh, require that the measure is really applied in a way that does not amount to arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between uh, countries where same or similar uh, conditions prevail. And in practice, that means that the EU would have to uh, allow third country producers to demonstrate that they produce at a carbon, in carbon intensity that is lower uh, than the respective benchmark or show that they have paid uh, 
a carbon price that must be discounted towards the EU's um, CBA charge. And moreover, it would also require the EU to open negotiations with third countries, and I think Andre will speak about that in a minute, um, uh, to mutually recognize each other's carbon uh, pricing regimes. What the, what the appellate body really didn't like or, and has condemned uh, to that effect, uh, however, is uh, measures that have a intended or actual coercive effect on specific policy decisions made by foreign governments. So, uh, in other words, imposing a punitive tariff uh, that we've talked about in the previous uh, presentations um, on imports um, from countries that are not party to the Paris Agreement or do not have the same carbon price policy as the EU, that, was seen, that would be seen as coercive and hence uh, very difficult to justify in, in litigation. Um, now, I think there, there are a number of other contentious and perhaps legally more interesting questions uh, or, or also exciting questions, for instance, regarding the, the board adjustment of the ETS uh, for exports or the actionability of free allowances under the SCM agreement. But, um, you know, that goes a little bit too far and, uh, and, and, and sort of uh, goes beyond the time frame that has been set by you, Gabriel. So let me stop here and, uh, and, uh, and turn back to you. So WTO compatibility is clearly possible, but it depends on the choice of measure and it's a complex issue. However, we still do not know how large third countries, such as US or China, plan to act in response to the new EU measures. André, which potential scenarios do you identify and what do they depend on? How could the EU influence a positive reception of its carbon border adjustment mechanism? André? Yes, Gabriel, those are very, very good, uh, very good questions. Um, I think essentially there are three, three potential uh, scenarios. A very positive scenario, I would say a mildly negative scenario, and a, in a very negative uh, scenario. Now, the, uh, the positive scenario is one whereby the EU uh, introduces uh, its measures, so it's very ambitious domestic measures, supplemented by some form of uh, CBA. And the, the result is that uh, other countries that do not at the moment have uh, ambitious measures are incentivized to, to adopt their own measures. So there indeed, uh, you know, it could be a club, it could be, uh, you know, at least a large number of countries or a, a number of countries that are responsible for a large share of the emissions. And then, you know, the EU would have accomplished really the goal, which is to reduce carbon emissions, not only by the EU, but by most of the uh, emitters. The second uh, scenario is that uh, countries uh, outside of the EU, uh, they pay uh, the tax or whatever form the CBA would, would, would take, and, um, but they don't, they don't adopt their own measures. So yes, their exports to the EU, uh, the carbon content of their exports to the EU uh, would, be, uh, would be reduced, but that would be a very small share of total carbon emissions in the world, and certainly of total carbon emissions of, of the partners. So that's, uh, it's not very positive, it's not very negative, it's sort of a mild uh, scenario, it does not achieve that much. Then there is a, a, a negative, a frankly negative scenario that may indeed involve countries like the US and, uh, and China potentially, where those countries challenge the EU measures. One is that you know, they may challenge it in law, and we just heard the different points that, that David made, you know, could go to the WTO and, and bring a challenge, but uh, they could also go beyond the uh, WTO challenge and actually take retaliation without waiting even for uh, the WTO uh, appellate body or mechanism to, uh, to authorize this, uh, this retaliation. Now, which of those three scenarios 
uh, will materialize. I think it's very hard to tell at the moment. We don't know exactly, you know, what measure the EU uh, would uh, would adopt, and we don't know therefore how countries would react. Uh, what we did is uh, Henry Korn and myself, who have worked on this, we interviewed foreign diplomats to try to assess from a number of large countries, from sort of major G20 countries, both uh, emerging and advanced ones, and we tried to, you know, see. What is the informal reaction? And there was clearly concern, concern about protectionist abuse, concern about unfairness, as we heard already from uh, developing countries. And then there were criticism about the process, that there's been a lack of bilateral consultation so far by the EU with some of its main partners, and also lack of consultation in the multilateral uh, framework. So what we did, Henrik, Orn and myself, in the paper that we wrote for the European Parliament's uh, Trade Committee, uh, we did very much recommend that the uh, EU, that the Commission essentially addresses those concerns and criticism and engages into a process, uh, both bilateral process and multilateral process with the uh, main trading partners. Uh, now, whether that will be enough as far as the China and the US, which are obviously the two countries that have the most capability of using retaliation, uh, whether that would be sufficient to engage into a process, that is difficult to say. And I think that will depend both on their domestic processes, uh, how are they evolving in those two jurisdictions about their own thinking about reducing carbon emission, and on the other hand, about uh, EU diplomacy to engage those uh, those partners. Gabriel? So, at least uh, potentially, um, uh, the new measure may backfire if the EU does not take precautions. Jody, from a developing country's perspective, do you see a risk that border carbon adjustment might be counterproductive in other ways? Two, do you see practical challenges in the implementation of such CBA? Jody. Thank you, Gabrielle. Yes, I think that um, Andre has outlined many of the, the big issues there. I think we do have to start asking, asking these more fundamental questions. You know, will these measures really uh, achieve their stated environmental objectives? And I do think we should start putting that under a bit more scrutiny. I mean, really, is this, you know, all that the EU has to offer on trade and climate? You know, there's a whole other lots of other areas where um, more kind of positive uh, incentives and action could be taken, particularly when we look at um, the issues around trade and development. I think there are, you know, questionable effects in terms of the effects of the measures on production and also on, on these incentives. Um, if we look at the share of production that's actually traded from the big players, um, such as China, it's actually fairly small. Um, so that raises the question around the effectiveness um, of the measure. And in terms of incentives, you know, these sorts of initiatives, punitive measures can weaken the incentives for innovation. And that's both domestically and abroad. Let's not forget, you know, that the sectors that we're talking about we do often hear um, about them quite frequently um, in terms of asking for support for other competitiveness challenges. So let's let's you know bear that in mind. We don't really want to end up with a kind of army of bureaucrats working on anti-dumping and then in addition um, border carbon uh, adjustment measures. And you know, in terms of the practical challenges. This will put a huge burden on customs officials, and that includes in developing uh, countries. And that is not, you know, something that we should take lightly. Um, given that many already struggle um, with standards uh, and um, proving compliance, and, and often, you know, lack um, effective support. And um, there's a lot more that could be done on that front. And um, there will be practical challenges. That's inevitable because this is the first time that such an instrument has been pioneered, and we do have some lessons. Um, although the air passenger duty, of 
duty is, of course, different. Conceptually, there are some similarities, and we know that there were some um, issues with that uh, mechanism um, as it as it um, started. So yes, there will be teething um, problems, but it's just going to be extremely challenging and extremely complex because you have will have. This, you know, firms within the same sector producing under very different conditions, but each import batch into the EU will need to have this uh, information on, on the carbon content. So it's going to be very tricky to do. And um, we know already that the technology is not quite there. Um, there is some discussion around kind of blockchain pilots, um, but we're yet to see, you know, you know, we're yet to see the results of, of these sorts of pilots. And I think, you know, it's important that we do start um, to see those if, if this is to be um, operationalized. Of course, the European Union could use its network of free trade agreements in order to ensure that there is this conformity assessment between partners. But as I mentioned in my earlier uh, previous intervention, how you know, where does that leave countries that don't trade under FTAs and that do rely on the preferential trade regimes, which frankly don't include much uh, on the environment at the, at the current time? Thank you. Now, Stephen, would you agree? And if so, how have developing countries approached similar issues with the EU in the past? And what steps are you taking now? Stephen. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, very important question. Um, of course, the EU is a very uh, close uh, trade and bilateral partner. And we have sought in uh, every instance uh, where there is a, uh, let's say, a common objective being pursued, but perhaps through different uh, channels to find uh, common ground to the extent possible. Um, as indicated earlier, uh, the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism will likely have some extraterritorial impacts. I think that is clear. Um, and in that context, uh, it would not be dissimilar uh, to some of the concerns which OECS member states have led um, and some of the challenges we face with other externally generated uh, set laws or rules which would have impacts on our ability to pursue uh, public uh, policy objectives. And, and, and that is not dissimilar uh, in terms of the uh, impact to the harmful tax initiative by the EU. Um, and responding to some EU generated directives such as the GDPR, of course, these are different sectors, um, but the impact uh, of uh, nonetheless uh, 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 felt uh, in OECS member states. Um, and of course, specifically to carbon, um, I indicated earlier, the air passenger duty uh, will have a direct impact on our competitiveness. So what have we done? Um, in the past, we have worked very closely with our partners to determine how best we can find, uh, let's say, a positive way forward. Um, on the air passenger duty, there was uh, extensive lobbying, uh, which resulted in the measure ultimately being withdrawn. Uh, regrettably, um, the efforts which have been made with respect to EU blacklisting, uh, we have sought to comply uh, with guidance, uh, with uh, different approaches such as uh, to uh, prevent ring fencing, uh, but blacklisting has persisted. So sanctions uh, have not necessarily been withdrawn. Uh, so we need to work closely, not only with the EU, uh, which is a very important uh, partner to us. But with all countries uh, which have taken the view uh, towards imposing a uh, border adjustment mechanism, uh, which is a laudable objective, um, but we would need to find a legal uh, non-discriminatory means of giving effect to an objective uh, which we believe is important uh, but ultimately in a way which does not undermine um, our ability to pursue uh, and achieve um, public uh, policy objectives. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Stephen. So this concludes the sort of part of our session, the first part of our session today. And we're now very happy to turn to the questions from you, from the audience. We start with three questions from the waiting line. Please do not forget to say your name and mention your affiliation.
after we've heard the answers from the panelists to these three sets of questions, I will read out three additional questions submitted to me in the Q&A or chat box where there are already many written questions. So questions from the floor. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Arthi Krishnan, and uh, uh, so thank you all for allowing me to ask this question. And this was an extremely interesting set of um, responses we got to the questions that you asked. Um, an important plugin would be that ODI has recently come out with a paper on counting carbon in global trade. Uh, and I can post a link to that there. And this takes into account chapters from academia, international organizations, private sector think tanks, and government officials. So hopefully that can also add and fuel this discussion further. In terms of my question, um, I think the panelists have alluded to the difficulty of measuring carbon content, the importance of carbon prices, and the need for consultation with LDCs in design of these instruments. But uh, my question tries to tie this all together by asking, in a world where production is fragmented across tasks and countries, and the carbon content of imports is extremely expensive and difficult to measure, how could uh, carbon border adjustments be governed to ensure fairness in who pays for what? And this question is open to anyone on the panel. Thank you very much, RT. Is there another question from the floor? Otherwise, I have written questions here. Are there other questions from the floor? So let me, before we go to the panelists, let me read out some of the written questions we've received. As Gabrielle just explained, so much of this discussion comes down to improving knowledge of the carbon content of traded goods. Why is there so little attention paid to improving these data? Could an international data effort help? Now, what does a carbon border adjustment imply for the design of global climate policy like the Paris Agreement and its objectives? Do we have a sense of the impact of a carbon border adjustment in presence of the ETS? in a world where other countries do not implement any climate policy? What would happen? So we now have four questions. I suggest that we go back to uh, the panelist in the initial order, except that I understand Stefan needs to leave very soon. So I wonder, Stefan, whether you want to comment or answer uh, on any of these four questions before you leave us. Stefan? Th thank you, Gabrielle, for the opportunity uh, to share. Uh, in fact, I uh, was about to um, take my leave. Um, it was, uh, I thought, thought it was a very enriching uh, discussion. Um, the only point I would like to leave with is that in order to uh, progress this discussion, it's, it is a need for uh, further uh, consultation uh, between not only the Europeans, but also with countries which will be impacted by uh, any uh, adjustment measure. So the, the final point from me uh, in this session is that the, this is the first uh, good uh, step in uh, providing visibility uh, to discussing the issue, and hopefully there will be future opportunities with uh, the relevant parties to find uh, an approach which is one, uh, non-discriminatory, two, which is fair and equitable in application, and three, which uh, reaches the objective of decarbonizing, reducing, and reversing the impacts of climate change 
ultimately in a way which is uh, beneficial uh, to all uh, across the globe, small, big, uh, medium-sized economies. Uh, with that, I have a, a very important meeting which I have to attend, and I thank you one and all for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank, thank you, you, Stephen. You we'll go to André, but before, there seems to be a question from the floor. We'll try to connect with the floor again before I go to Professor André Safir. The floor. Hi. Uh, it's Alan Cosby. Can you hear me all right? Speak louder. How's this? Better. Okay, thanks. Uh, a, a number of questions. I guess if I was going to focus on one, I, I'm interested in knowing um, or, or making a comment more and getting reactions. The uh, consumption charges option doesn't seem to me to be a replacement for SCBAM. It doesn't actually address the competitiveness or leakage impacts of increased ambition under an EU ETS. It only addresses its own impact. It relies on the reallocation under the EU ETS to deal with competitiveness and leakage impacts of the ETS itself. So I'm wondering why it's actually considered an, an alternative to a CBAM as opposed to maybe one tool in a constellation of tools uh, used uh, in, in the context of free ambition or increased ambition. Thank you. Very good question. We have now uh, 14 minutes. So two minutes uh, to the each panelist. André. Thank you, Gabriel. I will be I will be brief because I think that Gabriel and Lionel will have more to say than I do on on some of those questions. I I, I just want to to make one point. Um, clearly, many of the questions and rightly so were addressed to. André, we lost you. The connection is very bad. Uh, are you hearing me now? Are you no. hearing me? The connection are you has hearing? been always very difficult. Now no. it's a bit better. Yes. All right. So, as I was saying, the, the, the central question, I think, uh, which is addressed by many uh, participants, is about methodology. You know, I think that because of there are real genuine methodological issues, uh, it's incumbent, I think, upon the EU to discuss this with uh, some of its partners. And I, I would sort of group partners into three categories. There are those countries that are, and that the EU actually calls like-minded countries. That is countries that are not only committed to the Paris uh, Agreement, but who are actually implementing measures, some of them even sometimes more ambitious than, than the EU at the moment. Okay? That's the first group. The second group of countries are those countries that are committed to, uh, to the Paris Agreement, but that are not at the moment implementing their own measure. The third okay. group of countries, at the moment mainly the United States, who don't seem to be committed at all to the Paris Agreement. It seems to me that it is absolutely urgent to at least agree on methodology with the like-minded countries. Thank you, André. So a need to discuss and you group countries. Now, Gabriel and then Lionel. Gabriel? Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. Um, well, there have been a lot of very good questions, and I think they show how complex the issue at hand is. Um, Indeed, uh, maybe you know, starting with the last question, indeed, um, uh, only uh, having a consumption tax uh, would not be equivalent to a CPAM. Um, in particular, a CPAM that does exempt exports. So, uh, you know, a, a taxing domestic consumption does not lead to a level playing field for uh, domestic firms abroad. Uh, to achieve that, one has to go a step further, and uh, that could, for example, be to prolong uh, the output-based allocations uh, of uh, um, allowances in the European Union, um, meaning giving um, 
uh, pollution certificates away for free. Uh, the EU wants to phase that out by 2030, uh, but uh, that maybe has to be reconsidered if we go for the consumption ta uh, tax. The second point that I think is very important uh, has been raised in, by the questions as well. Uh, why uh, don't we know more about the carbon content of goods? And the, and the yeah. problem yeah. relates very much uh, to uh, the one I think that Arti asked, Arti Krishna, Global value chains are super complex and really tracking them down uh, is an enormously complicated business. What we can do uh, is uh, go uh, uh, through uh, global input output tables and approximate that. And that is what, for example, the global, global carbon project does. It calculates versions of the footprint, right. but they are very inaccurate because they, you know, use those very aggregate uh, input output tables and do not really track for the thousands of products that we have uh, in the customs uh, um, statistics, for example, track the carbon content. So it is probably mission impossible, uh, except if we really find technological solutions, um, meaning using, you know, new uh, techniques like the blockchain and economic mechanism design that uh, helps us with the issue that Lionel raised, what are the incentives of producers to give up information? You know, if you if you need to, to tell the market what the carbon content of your product is, you tell them possibly some of your production secrets, right? Uh, how you produce your steel or your whatever, cement and so on. And so getting the incentives right is complicated. And there is no short run solution to that for the time being. So I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you, Gabriel. Now, Lionel, then David. Lionel. So, thank you, Gabriel. So two minutes. So I, I would uh, I would like to start by reinforcing the, the point just made by Gabriel about this measurement of carbon content. So the importance, indeed, of global value chains, the fact that economies can rely on sector level evidence. Uh, so we know in a given sector, in a given country, what is the level, the level of emissions, but we, we don't know within that sector country cell, what is the level of emissions of firms. And when it comes to firms, yeah. they're heterogeneous. Uh, and so the level of their emissions is very different within a country sector cell, and they won't reveal it because we, we have no way of making them uh, revealing it. So there is really a problem of information there and that we don't know how to tackle. And if we were able to reveal uh, this uh, exact uh, content, then we would uh, be in position to discriminate among firms, among countries, etc. And then we would be back to uh, issues raised by David, which are issues uh, related to the legal, you know, uh, framework. So th this is the first point that I wanted to, to make. On, on the second point, what about the CBN presence of the implementation of the European scheme in a world where no other countries uh, implement such climate policies. Somehow, this is not the world we are living in because a series of countries are doing uh, something in terms of climate policy. But uh, somehow, this is also very close to where we are because China is doing a bit, but not too much yet. And the US decided to withdraw from, from the agreement. So when this is like this, with the, the, the CBA, what you can do is to reduce and this has been uh, explained by Gabriel, you can reduce uh, the, uh, the direct leakage, but you won't reduce the indirect leakage and you won't incentivize countries to join. And so when it comes to incentivize countries, there are different possibilities. So the club, the, 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 penalty, uh, the penalty at the penalty at the border, and last but not least, uh, it has not been discussed too much today, but the international negotiations. So maybe the, the, the good thing with the CBA as it has been launched by the EU is that it will somehow launch a new uh, series of international negotiations on these issues. And if we were uh, not able to implement uh, the CBA, it would uh, already be a big success to, to, to put the countries around the table in order to discuss uh, seriously these issues. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you. Yes, multilateral negotiations. We were just given an extra three minutes. So the two last speakers, uh, David and Jody, the two organizers, you have two, three minutes uh, to respond to the questions and your last comments. Thank you. Jody or oh, David? David, David first. 
Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Gabriel. Um, I think um, the the questions that were asked so far uh, were largely um, addressed to um, to Gabriel and uh, to Andre and to Lionel. So, so that you know, not so much of, of a legal nature. I think there's been uh, um, good questions from from Aaron Cosby on uh, on on the legal side of things. But uh, if we don't get to that, uh, I, I can pick that up with him uh, with him bilaterally afterwards. So that's uh, that's fine. Um, I pass on to Jody, uh, who uh, will have the concluding uh, uh, answer then. Thank you, David. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, I'll pick up on, on Artie's uh, question in particular, and I'll, I'll touch on Aaron's as well. I think, Artie, it's a really important question in terms of how should water carbon adjustment mechanisms be governed. But I think what we're talking about really is about this, this carbon price and who pays for what. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the EU is pushing ahead with this unilateral action in the absence of, you know, a, a, um, a, a complete multilateral um, agreement. But there's there's still a lot to play for in terms of the build up to, to COP26. Um, there's all of the issues around carbon markets that need to be resolved. So I think that, you know, the, the use of an EU reference point um, for the carbon price and in order to set the border, border carbon adjustment mechanism, I think that is likely to be um, quite contentious um, in, in the future. I, I do agree with Andre's point about you know working through the methodology with like-minded countries but i'd also add that you know the unfccc does also have a lot of methodologies for you know counting carbon um so it's about tr it's a bigger global economic governance issue I, I feel it's about how will the wto work with the unfccc framework um in the future i think for sure you know it's going to be extremely risky if we leave this down to the due diligence of firms you know we've already got big issues around ensuring that you know, multinational firms pay their taxes. So let's not, not go down, down that route. Um, to pick up on that that Aaron made about um, carbon taxes, I, I do understand the point about the carbon leakage, uh, but perhaps what we haven't covered in this panel session today um, is what happens with the resources that the EU would raise uh, from border carbon adjustment mechanisms. Where will those resources go? Will they go to plugging you know, the 100 billion funding gap um, that exists under the UNFCCC and that everyone's working hard to try to um, plug and to so that we can you know secure more um, ambitious commitments at, at COP26. I think that's a big question that we need to start um, asking. I think that's all Gabrielle you know um, just to flag that at ODI and um, we do have a meeting series called CLIMX Trade um, so we'll be keeping these conversations going um, in the build-up to COP26 of which the UK is, of course, is a co-host um, along with Italy. And um, so I hope that you can all uh, be part of that conversation um, with us as we move over the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Before I say goodbye, and maybe because I'm biased, I'm also a lawyer, and we have three minutes, four minutes even. Uh, David, I have a legal question that is quite good for you. Isn't it safer and more realistic to assume that any carbon border adjustment mechanism violate non-discrimination obligations, and then you should go straight to Article 20 analysis to see whether such measure could be justified. David, you have two minutes before right. we say goodbye. Yes. Um, well, well, thanks, Aaron, for that question. Um, I, you know, to some extent, I have a lot of sympathy with with your assumption that uh, that there is uh, discrimination that, that there is discrimination in in any of uh, in any of these measures. There will be discrimination in any of these measures. That really kind of depends on on who brings the challenge, though. So um, you know, the response or the defence, I think, would 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 really uh, depend on uh, on what kind of. Uh, uh, on, on, on what kind of situation the complainant is in, and uh, uh, but apart from that, I, I must say, uh, reading uh, a few or quite a couple of of those uh, WTO reports and upper body reports, I've never seen uh, the EU just jumping straight to uh, Article 20 defence and giving up on uh, on a potential uh, Article, you know, sort of Article 1 uh, defence or Article 3 defence. So uh, I think they will exhaust uh, all possibilities to uh, uh, to defend uh, uh, the measure under uh, 
under uh, every one of uh, the provisions, the obligations and the exceptions. Uh, so that um, I think is just a natural uh, course of things, um, uh, whether uh, you know there is a more likelihood or less likelihood um, um, of, of success uh, in the end. Um, so with that, I, uh, I hand back to Gabrielle and uh, she might agree or disagree. Uh, she, um, she probably, she's been working on these things much longer than I have. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Gabrielle wants to take it, wants to have a take on this as well. It remains an exception, but an, an exception that the appellate body said is as important as the rule. Governments have the rights to protect non-trade concern. This is as important as market access. But on this, I'd like to thank this outstanding panel of experts, and of course, Jody and David, the two organizers, for having involved me, and more importantly, the audience. And I wish you a good continuation. We could not end without thanking the Graduate Institute IT expert um, that have made all this possible. Thank you, everyone, and good luck.